if the media team is ready. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation of Fredrik Eriksson's uh, master thesis on behalf of Högskolan Dalarna and Högskolan i Gävle, from which I'm a representative. Uh, Fredrik's thesis is called Current Methods, Concepts and Theories Regarding Mobile Power Meters in Cycling. It's a critical review of the physiological and pedagogical implications for training, racing and performance testing. And today's uh, opponent is uh, Jonny Nilsson from Stockholm. And the examinator is Thomas Tivel from the National Academy of Science in Estonia. And the supervisor has been Mikael Tonkonogi. Uh, today's procedure will be as follows. Fredrik will present his thesis, and then Johnny will ask some uh, good questions, and then hopefully. hopefully good questions. And then anyone in the auditorium can ask questions, and finally the examinator will have some remarks. Okay. All right. Uh, then I will proceed. Uh, we are a little bit late with this. Uh, the paper was actually uh, ready uh, about uh, a little more than a year ago. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my supervisors got very ill in cancer and uh, died this uh, autumn. So I would actually like to start by holding a uh, one minute silence uh, in memory of uh, Tommy who was the supervisor for the pedagogical part. So, beginning right now. All right, I will proceed. Like I said, uh, the, the paper is uh, actually about one year delayed. Uh, the only implications that has is that since, uh, since then I haven't put any more effort into it. And uh, since the 1st of January 2009, uh, I have been able, I did a research, a search on uh, PubMed about uh, two days ago. And I could only find around seven new uh, scientific papers that uh, could possibly have been included or have have any major uh, implications for this for this paper. Since then, also uh, the, there has been uh, the, or will be released a very uh, a book that I, I'm referring to a lot in my paper. A second edition of that book will be released in the, the beginning of April now. I don't know what is in it. I have just ordered it. But that could also have some implications for the paper. <coughs> also, uh, the major software that is used uh, or talked about in this uh, paper will has... Uh, there's a new edition of that software as well. And a new kind of power meter has also emerged that uh, could very well make some of the assumptions I make here not uh, false but uh, could bring new light into it. So that is what has been going on since I finalized the paper. Mobile power meters in cycling is kind of the, the new and hottest trend in, uh, in cycling training and uh, analysis at the moment, especially analysis of training and racing. Uh, it, they have been around since about 1986, when a German guy first produced the first power meter. And the good thing about them, the, the really spectacular thing about them, is that they bring true knowledge of performance for racing cyclists. I mean, uh, results, you can see who was first, second or third, but you don't really know who performed the best uh, 
when it could talk about uh, the performance into the pedals, so to speak, the physiological performance. <coughs> you can use power meters in all the major uh, cycling disciplines. Uh, they are uh, very objective. They are so far been proven to be most of them, or some of them, rather reliable and of course very valid for, uh, for uh, analyzing cycling. The growth of the, the popularity and the growth of the power meeting community uh, just on this, uh, during this almost uh, a little bit more than one year since I finalized the paper uh, has uh, the, the major discussion forum which as I also have been uh, using in my research has grown from 4,386 members to a little bit more than 7,000 members in just this uh, one and a half year period. So uh, things are happening. There are some drawbacks to power meters of course. Uh, the, the most uh, prominent of these is that they are still very expensive. The, most, the cheapest ones uh, sell for around $1,000 uh, and uh, the most expensive ones costs, I think, 8,000 euros for the scientific uh, SRM. The, the mo the, most of them, the most popular two brands are around, uh, well, two to 3,000 uh, euros. The aim of this uh, paper, it's a, it's a critical review of all the physiological implications uh, that uh, uh, that could be brought on to uh, to uh, to power meters for uh, racing and training, and uh, I wanted to find the the methods, theories, and concepts that are currently used today, and try to see which of these are scientifically valid and uh, and based and have a good scientific base. So the the questions I asked uh, when I started out this paper was which are these methods, concepts and theories and what are the physiological implications for, uh, <coughs> uh, I know, what is the physiological knowledge that have implications for these methods, concepts and theories. So that was the quest. The method I have been using is uh, I did a, a, a search on the, the Google forum which is by far the biggest uh, discussion forum about power meters to find the, all of these uh, methods, concepts and theories. From there I chose the ones that seemed uh, most popular and uh, most debated uh, and uh, tried to find uh, some scientific, scientific uh, well, base for these and uh, tried to review them as as well as possible. I used the, the databases here in, uh, that are available at Högskolan Dalarna and gathered I think in total 234 uh, scientific articles and 23 books and uh, then I sat down and made a critical review of all the, the implications they have for power meters. To summarize the results well, first you can read this little uh, cartoon if you want. Hopefully this will not apply to this one. <laughs> this is a table uh, that summarizes all the, the, the methods, concepts and theories I found on the search uh, in Google Groups how many hits uh, that were on this forum. One of the major reasons that I chose this forum is because, like I said, it's the biggest, it's very easily accessible to anyone, so it would be very easy for someone to test these results in, uh, after, after me, so to speak. <coughs> and as you can see, there's quite a lot of, uh, of things to, to cover, so we will rapidly move forward. From those, the list there, I chose these uh, topics, and uh, I will try to summarize them uh, as well as I can here today. 
and my conclusions. I realized uh, when I put the, the, the sack there that in Swedish, when you, when you like bring everything together, full circles, it's tying the, the sack together, it doesn't really work in English, but so we can skip this part. <laughs> anyway, the first chapter is uh, pacing and racing tactics. Uh, and uh, when it comes to, to pacing, there is a very sound scientific basis for using a power meter, meter during the race, at least for efforts longer than about two minutes. That's uh, the conclusion I can draw from, uh, from the, the material I've seen. Uh, the power meter can be uh, very useful for post-ride analysis of racing but there are more research needed, especially when it comes to mass start racing. And during mass start racing in cycling, uh, power meters can, can definitely be useful, but there is a lot more to, to be learned, learned before we can draw any definite conclusions and give definite uh, uh, guidelines how to use the power meter in this setting. When it comes to performance testing, uh, this might be one of the most useful areas for power meters because uh, they really offer a, a very valid and sport specific uh, analysis of the performance of a rider. Since, uh, well, especially compared to, uh, to laboratory testing. <coughs> if you have a power meter, they are very practical and fairly easy to use compared to a lot of the, the, the equipment you can see in the laboratory which de demands a more qualified uh, user. The major problems when it comes to performance testing is reliability and, uh, and standardization of the tests because uh, when you do the test in the, in the field setting there are a lot of factors to consider which makes it rather complicated and that is definitely the big problem with, uh, with tests with uh, using a mobile power meter. Also there are some debate if the sensitivity of the power meter is, is good enough to detect small changes in the performance uh, which is mostly a problem in the, for elite athletes where the, the difference between a medal and, and not having a medal can be ridiculously small. Uh, using power meters you can also get a very good profile uh, of each rider to see the strengths and weaknesses of uh, every rider and uh, the performance profile the profiling is uh, certainly something that's worth looking into and uh, one of the updates in the new uh, new software I was speaking about earlier the cycling peaks uh, one of the updates is a better uh, power profiling included in that software. Uh, the, like I said, the major problem is methodology when it comes to uh, power performance testing with power meters. On the other hand, there is quite a lot of debate regarding methodology when it comes to tests in the labor laboratory as well. So, well, it's uh, but it is a problem. In the paper, I have tried to summarize which uh, performance capacities uh, or physical parameters that you can test with the, the <coughs> with the power meter, and it's basically all the things, all the physical uh, physiological parameters you need uh, as a cyclist. You have the anaerobic lactic uh, ability, which you can uh, test with the inertial load test or the the peak five second power. Uh, actually, I think I I didn't before I started with this paper. I was not aware about the of the inertial load test, but it really stuck out and seems very promising when it comes to uh, performance testing of anaerobic lactic abilities, and also as a uh, a test for uh, talent identification. Uh, when it comes to anaerobic lactic abilities, uh, longer sprints, uh, you can use the Wingate test out in the field, just like you do with, a, with, a, with an ergometer. Uh, or you can use the, the anaerobic work capacity, uh, AWC. 
both of these uh, also have a, a good sound basis um, <coughs> for for using um, in the field. So uh, no really big problems, more than the the general methodological methodology problems there. Uh, maximal aerobic capacity or VO2 max or um, those uh, measurements. The ma mean maximal power for 3 to 10 minutes uh, seem like a very valid uh, a test to, to test this area. When it comes to the anaerobic threshold, which, which in power output terms is called the functional threshold power, uh, the, the mean uh, maximal power for 60 minutes also seems very uh, very well uh, how do you say uh, underbuilt or uh, the foundation is very good for, for those that kind of uh, testing when it comes to longer capacities it is a little bit more problematic uh, I draw the conclusion that it should be included some have tried but it's very uh, difficult when you talk about maximal efforts of longer than one, one hour uh, perhaps up to around three hours it's a little bit sketchy, but uh, it's w considering the importance of uh, the lipolytic capacity in endurance athletes, it's worth looking into. Uh, but that is uh, probably the, the area when it comes to tests that is least explored at the moment. The third chapter is uh, quantifying the demands of competition. Uh, this is a very promising field also, uh, considering that uh, the power the power meter gives true knowledge of performance, as many of you know, uh, in cycling racing, especially when it comes to uh, mass start racing, but also in uh, time trials. It's not how well, only how well you, you perform yourself that uh, decides your place, uh, your, your result in the competition. In time trials, it's how well you perform minus the, the uh, aerodynamic drag. And uh, in mass start racing, team tactics and the, the, the course profile and all kinds of things uh, cloud uh, the, the judgment. You cannot, you, it's very difficult to use competitive results as a, as a measure of a performance level. So the power meters can supply objective data uh, of the physio physiological demands of cycling. And uh, especially interesting is that you can do it in all uh, disciplines. And also go in and look, for example, in road cycling for every team member. I see how well does a sprinters, how does a sprinters race look like, how does a climbers race look like, and so on, and or a or a domestic or a helpers race look like. I think that it's actually kind of surprising that not more uh, research has been done using power meters. Of these, uh, the the articles that uh, the papers that have uh, been published since uh, I finished this, none of them are uh, looking into uh, cyc the demands of cycling using a power meter. There are two that looks into the demands of cycling use uh, no the demands of triathlon using a power meter, but none looking into the demands of cycling. Although there are, I think I've just uh, brushed by. Uh, two or three papers looking into the demands of cycling using heart rate monitors, which I consider, well, think is very out of date at the moment, considering that most professional riders are very used to, and um, a lot of them already race with uh, power meters. And uh, very often at the end of uh, big cycling races, like the Tour de France or something, you can see uh, power output uh, data from, from a lot of the top riders. It would be very easy to gather this data and get a better view of uh, the demands of cycling. Um, so I'm very surprised that not more has emerged in this area. Chapter 4 is uh, power-based uh, training zones. Uh, <coughs> establishing uh, training zones based on power output has some advantages over uh, other forms of training zones like heart rate or uh, perceived exertion or uh, lactate or speed. Um, but it has to be used a little bit uh, differently. So especially uh, the big consideration is that uh, the power output is put is very stochastic. It's very variable, uh, which makes it uh, much more difficult to stay at a certain uh, power output. Like riding 
in a certain zone of the certain training zone but that isn't necessarily not uh, necessarily the point of the training as long as you keep the 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 average power or the normalized power which we will go into later at the, the correct level there seems to be a very good scientific basis for uh, basing uh, the zone establishing the zones from uh, the functional ma uh, threshold power or the maximal aerobic power uh, which uh, both of the most the major uh, two uh, concepts or uh, the the applications the two uh, uh, there are two big uh, power output training zone uh, types one is established by uh, Dr. Andrew Cogan and the other one is by uh, Richard Stern and those are the most common and both seem to uh, be on, on, on sound grounds uh, generally. When it comes to anaerobic training uh, it might be worth looking, not using the functional threshold power or map but perhaps using uh, the data from anaerobic tests such as the wind gate or the inertial load test. I haven't seen anybody really do that but uh, that could be a, a good uh, step forward for the future to, to explore that. Uh, also relating the objective data, power data to your own subjective perceived exertion is also a very good uh, uh, way of fine-tuning the your, your feeling or your own ability to feel and sense your effort. So uh, combining training zones or uh, relating the training zones power output to your own effort, feel of effort, uh, also has some, uh, some interesting advantages. <coughs> uh, I also looked into uh, how to analyze training and racing uh, and here there are some some uh, methods uh, or concepts that uh, are commercial and uh, the, the major ones of these are normalized power intensity factor and quadrant analysis uh, for for a deeper understanding of of what these are I refer to the paper uh, but they, they are all very promising tools uh, but for all of them, I would, th I would say that more research is needed before uh, they are fully explored how to use. Uh, there are some, uh, some question marks here. When it comes to data on energy expenditure, of course a power meter measures the work you have done. And thus you can uh, see how much uh, energy you have uh, <coughs> used. Uh, this is very reliable. Uh, and valid, of course, but it's limited to just that. You can see how much energy you have used. It's like heart rate, it only measures how fast your heart is beating, nothing more, really. Uh, power meters can also uh, give some insights to the pedaling dynamics. Uh, here there are, unfortunately, um, the power meter itself gives very good data, but it's very difficult to interpret this data because there are so many different uh, theories regarding how uh, power output and especially the cadence, the, the pedaling frequency, uh, affects the body and, and performance. So it's, it's, it's just a jungle and uh, at the moment it's, it's not really possible to draw any definite conclusions at all. Uh, I think the final chapter uh, is the planning and uh, monitoring of the training process. Also here, uh, there are two uh, commercial uh, methods and uh, concepts that I've looked into. It's the TSS, which stands for Training Stress Score, and uh, the PMC, which is a Performance Manager Chart. The Training Stress Score is... Uh, <coughs> is a value that uh, you get from a training session based on, uh, on the power output that tells you how hard your training session was, how, what, what strain did it put on the, on the body. And the performance manager chart is a uh, impulse response uh, model of performance uh, trying to, uh, to correlate 
what you have been training, uh, for how long and how hard you've been training, and correlate that to performance, how well you are performing. Uh, of these, uh, both are very promising. Uh, of these, um, I think the, the TSS has come uh, the furthest, and I would uh, argue that it is at the moment the best, um, most valid and reliable objective measure of training and racing for cyclists. Uh, the alternative is trims based on heart rate or just uh, basing your, uh, uh, your, uh, your measurements of uh, effort on uh, your perceived exertion. But there are still some, uh, some answers uh, that need, uh, some questions that need answers when it comes to the TSS. The performance manager chart is very impressive uh, and uh, if it would work as well as it is uh, said to work, it would be absolutely fantastic. But uh, I think uh, that there is, it is unfortunately too blunt at the moment uh, to really deliver the, the results. It, it kind of promises. And uh, one of the papers that uh, have uh, emerged since I finished this, uh, I took a quote from there, however, such models may also be constrained by the large number of data sets required to train the model. And uh, in here lies two problems uh, with the p performance manager chart. It is a lot of data uh, and uh, also at the moment it's, I think, uh, it's not possible to, to train the model uh, to adjust it for uh, or individualize the model enough at the moment. I think there's more to, uh, to do in that area. So very promising, but uh, more research is needing, needed. The, other, the third and last uh, concept when it comes to planning and monitoring the training process is something called aerobic decoupling. And it's uh, when you correlate uh, power output over time to uh, heart rate over time and see uh, if they start to uh, uh, decouple, go away from each other, meaning either that the, heart, the, the power output for a given uh, heart rate drops or, uh, further into the training session or that uh, at a given power output the heart rate is higher. And this is uh, thought to be uh, used as a measure to see how aerobically fit a rider is. There are some uh, very, uh, there is some good support for this in the in the literature, but I think it's at the moment too uh, blunt and too uh, insensitive to the the small uh, differences in uh, in aerobic fitness. That at least once again at the elite level, uh, I think it's too different, difficult to use at the moment. Perhaps it can be fine tuned in the future to uh, to work better. That is uh, the results uh, I have to, uh, to give you today. So uh, let's uh, start with the, the questions and see what we can find there. Yes, I'll start. I have about one, half an hour or something like that. Something like that. How much time did I use? About half an hour. Yeah, you gain a lot of time. Right? Yeah. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a uh, uh, kind of double uh, uh, thesis. It has both the bachelor level and also the master uh, level. Uh, it's my uh, duty today to uh, to uh, cover the uh, master part, so that's what, what's going to happen now. The pedagogical part, I will not uh, step into. That will be examined later. Later, yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I will uh, concentrate on the uh, master uh, part, so to speak. Um, it's my general opinion that uh, this uh, master thesis covers a um, uh, relevant uh, area of research. It also brings up uh, important uh, issues uh, which uh, are also uh, elaborated in a creative way, I think. So my position from the start is very positive. I think you have done a good job. I will try to get into some details and elaborate uh, also on the uh, practical consequences uh, of uh, the ideas you bring up uh, and what's your standpoint in this respect. Yeah. Um, 
concerning the design of the uh, of the thesis, uh, I found it a little bit uh, problematic in, in the beginning because it was actually a double a double uh, thesis. So it took me some time to figure out the academic structure. I had to read until the methodology uh, before I got the answer that it was actually a double thesis and, and uh, defining in, in, in which way it would have helped, I would say, to have this on the front page or uh, quite early in, in the, uh, the thesis. Uh, but the general structure of the, uh, uh, the thesis, uh, if I don't concentrate on, on the uh, master part, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a uh, good uh, structure. Uh, I think uh, you have uh, the, uh, especially the methodology, which is very important in the concerning the uh, uh, literature study. Uh, it's very important to have a, a selection of the area uh, to be relevant and also possible to, to cover in, in, a, in a reasonable way. I think you have done that. And also uh, concern the keywords, of course. Uh, what are the actual uh, keywords you are concentrating and, and uh, searching for? And also the possibility for others to, to check out that they, they, if they think that you have uh, found out the right things about uh, the different aspects. Um, you start up then with an ab abstract that. Uh, gets a little bit problematic due to the fact that uh, it uh, actually uh, uh, handles both the bachelor part and the uh, and the master part. I had a little bit problem to uh, to sort it out, but it was uh, it was more clear when I came to the uh, method part when uh, the academic structure was uh, kind of uh, um, explained. It's a little bit unusual uh, structure with the uh, with the both areas uh, well, into the same. Maybe it's, uh, it's uh, common. No, I think it's uh, it's unusual. Okay. Anyway, it's no it's no uh, no big deal. So it's uh, um, and then you also uh, claim that you uh, uh, kind of uh, strive to to uh, um, write for the uh, mainstream users. I guess you mean uh, writers and, and guys like that. Uh, writers or coaches, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then I think they had uh, quite a substantial background in physiology and training uh, theory, I guess. And also, you, you um, use nu uh, numerous of abbreviations which are not uh, uh, explained at sight. You can take for granted that they know about this. I don't uh, really think that everyone knows about these type of abbreviations if they're not very much into the field, so to speak. Yeah. So this mainstream user Maybe I should uh, take that out of the, th that claim should come out. Uh, uh, my suggestion is that you just have a, a one page uh, in, in the very beginning with an uh, explanation of all the abbreviations and uh, okay. I, I think that will solve the problem. Yeah. Because they are relevant to use, definitely, it uh, saves a lot of space later on. So, so I, uh, I'm happy with that, but uh, for, for the mainstream user, I think you should uh, have a, a cover like that in the beginning. Uh, concerning the methods, as I said, I found the, uh, the uh, selection of area uh, good, relevant, and also the keywords. Uh, and I, I think that also uh, mirrors in the, uh, in the writings that you, you perform in, in, in your thesis. So, so far, so good. And uh, my uh, ambition now is try to, to make this as practical as possible. So I would really like to, to uh, get your opinion uh, about a lot of the things that you have actually brought up now and, and also put, uh, brought forward very interesting data upon uh, how, you, how, how you look upon it uh, more in detail, how you uh, uh, evaluate the different uh, uh, physiological and also PM uh, uh, results and, and data and how you combine that in, in a more practical point of view, so to speak. Yeah. So first of all, I think it's would be worthwhile if you could uh, explain a little bit about the uh, PM meter, so to speak. What are the actual parameters that are, are measured and calculated in, 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 in the, power? In the power meter. Well, that uh, it depends a little bit on, on the power meter. Uh, all of them, of course, measures power output. I think almost all of them also uh, includes uh, cadence, uh, pedaling frequency, and uh, speed, and uh, most of them also uh, include heart rate. Um, 
into it. Some have uh, altitude, some have uh, GPS. So most of, most of them measures a lot of uh, a lot of data. Uh, the new power meter that is on the way that I brought up in the beginning that has emerged since I finished the paper will. The big issue with this one is that it's measuring uh, the power directly in the pedals. So uh, it will be possible to measure every unique uh, pedal stroke and left and right leg individually, separately, okay. which no power parameter today uh, has done. So that is the kind of data you can, uh, you can uh, gather with the power meters. Some of them also convert uh, power output to, uh, to torque uh, and also tries to, um, before the, the new power meter, which is called uh, uh, Metrigear, uh, Metrigear uh, Vector. Before this one, which actually me uh, measures power at the pedal, at the site where uh, the body meets the bike, uh, they, some of the others try to calculate the pedal forces as well. So that, uh, that is pretty much the kind of data you will uh, be able to gather with the power meter. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is that I think it's uh, um, for, uh, for an academic point of view, <laughs> but also I think from a practical point of view it's important to know what is actually measured and what is calculated. Uh, uh, it's common among, uh, around the world that we are talking about power meters, but are we really uh, measuring something here? I think we are calculating. The basic uh, parameters are actually force and velocity, and that uh, constitutes power. So I think that was is uh, important to highlight because uh, it's uh, that's what we measure, and uh, if we measure something, we, that's what we're going to focus on when we uh, look upon uh, reliability and stuff like that. So um, in this case, uh, probably uh, you, you the basic measuring uh, aspects are, are some, you use some kind of uh, strain gauge. Exactly. Uh, there has been one power meter which I bring up in the uh, in the paper. I think I also mentioned that the problems with it, uh, it's the, the Ergmo power meter, which measures power optically, uh, optically, only on the left side, and then does it times two. Okay. And they are no longer in business uh, because of uh, their, their flaw in, yes. in, uh, in design and how they measure power output. Because like you said, it's, it's, it's a calculation more than a... a yeah, it's a kind, true of, measure. It's kind, of, kind of tricky. I uh, know that Polar, for example, uh, uh, transformed the vibration, as you also pointed out in your uh, thesis, uh, the vibration in the chain, and uh, uh, have uh, some kind of uh, relationship between that and the, the actual force produced. Uh, it's kind of a smart way to, to get hold on one of the uh, main parameters, na namely the force. And then they, uh, to calculate the velocity is much uh, simpler. Uh, then you can use uh, inductors, inductors or stuff like that, and you just know the circumference of the, of the uh, wheels and, and so on. And then you can get a, a quite a good grip of the displacement, and you have the time uh, time unit as well, uh, constantly uh, working in the system. But uh, uh, the force are, uh, must have, have been uh, calculated in some way or another, and. and uh, or measured, sorry, sorry yeah. measured, uh, or calculated. Because if you have a, tor a torque uh, uh, recorder, uh, some some equipment that can actually uh, that uh, you use in order to to establish the torque, then you can calculate uh, with the lever arm uh, what the actual force is. And in the case of cycling, you always know the lever arm because that is the the crank length. Yeah. Uh, there are, is also, uh, when it comes to calculating the, the, the power output, there is uh, a power meter called the iBike, which doesn't measure anything uh, with strain gouges or anything. It, measure, it calculates the power output from uh, the speed and uh, the, um, the, the, this, uh, the elevation gain or, uh, or loss, if you're climbing or descending, and, and, uh, and calculates power output from that. Um, so there are some, some ways, and, and all power meters, and that is also a little bit of, bit of a problem, well, it's a problem if you're not aware of it, that all power meters give a little bit different power output data. Uh, 100 watts isn't always 100 watts uh, if you're using different equipment. It's uh, 100 watts is 
one workload if you're using an SRM or a PowerTap or an iBike or or if you move everything indoors and you use a Cyclist 2 or a Monarch or, or something like that. I think it's good that you bring this up because uh, this, this is, uh, I think, a key point when we're talking really about uh, the, uh, the preciseness of the measurement. Because if you start utilizing uh, algorithms uh, that are at the, uh, calculating the, the, uh, uh, the from, from the mass of the, of the, uh, the, the rider and the elevation, and uh, from that, uh, get the component, uh, the force component that are working in the in the uh, in the riding direction, and from uh, and using uh, different formulas to calculate the uh, the wind resistance stuff like that in order to get the force, in order to calculate the power. Then we are we have uh, several steps that are yeah. not so secure. No. So could you have a very accurate force recording directly on site, directly under the foot? That would be optimal. And that's why I'm quite excited with the new Metrigear Vector, yeah, because yeah. it seems very pr promising. But uh, when it comes to uh, the most calculated uh, for power output, it's the iBike. The, the, good, the good thing with the iBike is, if you, you, which you can, combine the, the iBike with a direct force uh, power, power meter, like uh, SRM or Metrigear, you can uh, actually calculate the wind resistance and make uh, it, it kind of becomes uh, uh, a mobile wind tunnel because the iBike measures the, the wind forces and all the external forces and the, the on-site power meter measures the direct power output and voila you have a, a kind of a mobile wind tunnel. I don't think I covered it uh, in uh, this uh, paper because I felt it was more of a it wasn't it wasn't physiological or it, and it wasn't pedagogical, but still, it's a very interesting uh, application for power meters. Yeah. But what uh, worries me a little bit in, in the future is that uh, uh, there are companies making very fancy softwares and present very nice uh, data. But uh, then it's, I think it's very important to, to go back to what is actually measured and, and uh, how is it measured. So, uh, uh, it's especially in the scientific point of view, it's very important to get to the basic uh, uh, measured data and see how, and be able to follow and control that. Yeah. Uh, in in order to to uh, make estimation about how accurate it is, and and your or hopefully we can get into that a little bit later. If you are measuring uh, or try to evaluate small changes in performance among top athletes, but people that have reached uh, very high on, on the development. There's very small things to, to further gain, so to speak. It's very small uh, changes. And uh, then it also puts a very high uh, demand on the, the measuring gear that we are using. And at the moment, the, the accuracy of the power meters we have today is about plus minus 2%, which is actually, in my opinion, too large to re really be able to use at the absolute top elite But still, level. From, a, from a medical point of view, it's co uh, that's good. Okay. That's good. <laughs> but it's still not, uh, it's, it's still, uh, yeah. it, it is good, but it's uh, still not enough, really, to make, uh, to make the, the very fine uh, We get some problems here. And uh, another thing I think uh, that you uh, mentioned a little bit uh, with the new meters is that they have a higher sampling rate. But uh, the sampling rate I was uh, uh, presented in, in your thesis, um, you uh, said something about one or uh, two hertz. Two hertz, yeah, yes. one or two hertz. Yes. And that's uh, quite, uh, if you're going to have a good uh, recording on, on the, uh, the force production, for example, it's, I think the uh, minimum uh, uh, sampling rate should be about 100 hertz in order to really cover uh, the uh, force production in, yeah. the, in the pedal or so. So that, uh, I uh, can welcome the, uh, uh, I, I, I think I was uh, interpret you right that when it's going to be a high sampling rate. With the metric gear? You, you could have uh, yes. measuring force. Uh, then I haven't read that. about it, to, I think, uh, I think I saw uh, uh, some data where they had 30 sampling points per, per pedal stroke and considering that a normal uh, Pedals, uh, pedaling rate is around 90, that would be uh, around uh, 50 yeah. measuring points. So that's half of what could be, but it's still uh, 20 times, uh, 25 times more, or even 50 yeah. times more than uh, some uh, most other power meters today. 
So it's getting better, but it's perhaps not. And it, I could be wrong. It could actually be higher, but probably with I'm the new uh, integrated circuits uh, that are actually occurring on the market, uh, the uh, storing of data is uh, is less of a problem. Uh, uh, continuously, so probably we can store enormous uh, uh, amount of data uh, during whole race and uh, during long trading sessions and stuff like that without any problems. Um, okay, I think we leave the if it's okay with you. Yeah, no problem. Um, the uh, that part for the moment at least. Uh, performance testing. One question to you is, uh, what uh, what is worth testing? Uh, for example, for a road. Uh, racer uh, and the mountain bike uh, racer. If you just spontaneously bring out some ideas. Uh, For road cycling it's it's quite uh, complicated uh, due to the fact that there are a lot of different um, positions and uh, how to say expertise uh, specialties on the road being a time trialer sprinter and and so so on. It's on the road you need to measure a lot of things but with mountain biking, and I think I wrote that in the in the paper as well. For mountain biking, I think the most valid uh, and interesting uh, testing point is the the five minute mean maximal power uh, correlated to your body weight, uh, to your relative body weight. And uh, I think, well, that that's the conclusion I, I draw, drew. Why? Why do you think? Because uh, with mountain biking, uh, riding uphill is extremely important that's why uh, you need uh, for first you need a, a, a high VO to max and preferably a high VO to max relative to your body weight and um, uh, the five minute m or three to ten minute mean maximum power yeah. is uh, of all the the measurements you can do with the power meter that is the one that measures uh, maximal aerobic power or VO to max most accurately and then rela uh, relating that to body weight, well, that's uh, and above all, and uh, on top of that, normally in mountain bike racing, the hills you uh, you uh, encounter are very often between three and ten minutes long. Yeah. So uh, I would say that that is, if you have to choose one test, that's it. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely use the inertial load test or the functional threshold power as well in in mountain biking. Uh, you mentioned in in the, in, in the thesis that uh, the. Uh you could explain uh, the var variation uh, about 40 percent with uh, with the V2 max in mountain bike racing. Is that correct? Could be. Uh, so I'm, I don't have that on the top of my head. Uh. Can you comment that in relation to uh, to uh, what you just said about the importance of testing maximum aerobic power? Well. Uh, if if that was true uh, that it was 40 percent of the the variation then i mean then almost half of the 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 performance uh, as a mountain biker is your uh, aerobic power and uh, that is uh, three to ten minutes maximal mean maximal power is you're usually very very close to your uh maximal aerobic power output i'm trying to find the the i'm guessing it should be uh, Sitting at uh, page 17, but I couldn't find that directly. 70 or 17? No, 17. Must be something else. No, that was a slow component. Yeah. No, uh, okay. Ah, we can uh, drop that for the moment. Uh, one thing I want to. Uh, to uh, one point I want to make here is that. Uh, uh, I like the uh, power concept that you bring up because it, it tells something about the, what actually the rider can perform. And uh, if you ha if you can if you can deliver uh, or produce uh, in average 700 watts during uh, one hour race, you have a certain uh, competence as a rider. Then you have a very good and competence as a rider. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you can state that very clearly. Yeah. If you can do this, uh, you, you will succeed very well in, 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 uh, in this sport. And, and that's a very uh, good... Uh, actually, also, it's what you could use in work per unit of time. So, um, 
that you can continuously record and, uh, during training, your, uh, during racing, and, and uh, also in testing, uh, which is very uh, valuable. So I agree with that. But um, what I want to add here is also, and I think you indirectly do this, uh, you are talking actually about what uh, do these power measures uh, correlate to in, in the physiological point of view. And you're uh, coming into oxygen uptake, you're coming into anaerobic, uh, lactacid and lactacid uh, processes and uh, ways to do that. My point is that uh, I think the combination uh, uh, of power and uh, lactate, heart rate, uh, oxygen uptake, that could be a very powerful combination. Of course we can't do that during tracing, but in, in testing and, and uh, uh, in training, especially if you're training uh, in a laboratory in a, or in a Specialized facility. What's well, your opinion about that? Well, I, I think definitely that uh, uh, that could be something to explore more in the future. And I don't think you have to do it also, uh, not necessarily in the laboratory, because there are mobile uh, um, equipment for uh, indirect calori calorimetry uh, to measure oxygen uptake in the field. So you could basically have somebody ride a mountain bike track. With a power meter, with the with the with the mobile Jaeger or whatever, and with a heart rate monitor, and when they come uh, back to the start finish after one lap, you can make a, a finger take a blood sample from the same finger, and you can basically have all these uh, physiological and performance uh, measurements in, in one. Uh, Certainly, that would be interesting. Uh, it's it's just a base, um, actually more a matter of analyzing the data because you're going to have a lot of data from the oxygen uptake, from the power, from the heart rate, maybe from a GPS, from speed, and so on. Maybe even uh, there are talks about having accelerometers on the bicycle to see uh, the vertical, uh, to see uh, how well you, how smoothly you uh, navigate the bike through the terrain. So, it's more. Uh, <coughs> a matter of analyzing the data. Somebody who has to get a big load of data on their desk and try to sort everything out. Uh, so it's... Yeah, it's a matter of some kind of optimal um, combination, I guess. I, uh, I think so. But in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in a place like uh, Fallen with the, with the tradition and, and a very good laboratory... In, in, uh, and great mountain... For, if you yeah. take mountain biking, for example, we have a World Cup uh, level course just uh, exactly. a few hundred meters away. So it's just a matter of what to, what to choose, uh, but it's your uh, is it your opinion that uh, we only stick with power. And, uh, if you have to stick with one thing, okay. power is it. Okay. That is my opinion. Because but, uh, if you look at all those measures, mm -hmm. the only one that's really interesting is well, uh, if you take away the the final result list of the Olympic Games, then power output is the most interesting thing to to look at because that really tells you how good you are. Uh, heart rate doesn't tell you actually how good you are and. Uh, in some way, uh, VO2 max doesn't tell how good you are either. Uh, the only thing that really matters is how much uh, work can you produce into the pedals. Yeah, so far I'm 100% uh, uh, in agreement with you. But uh, to that uh, point, when you are in the training phase, you are trying to, uh, to uh, um, adapt two energy systems, the aerobic energy system and the anaerobic energy system. Yeah. And then, then you want to, if you... Uh, uh, expose the rider for a certain type of uh, training, you want to figure out how this particular system responds to this uh, training. And then you are helped by the power because then, then you can decide in, in relation to, to uh, max uh, uh, power output, this rider uses about uh, 70 uh, percent. And that tells you something. Yeah. And then you expect something to happen with the physiology. And then you're interested to record something about the physiology. For example, the lactate, you see if they pass uh, the anaerobic threshold, if they're st still on, on the lactate level or, or whatever. Yeah. Or what happens with the uh, heart rate in, uh, as, as some kind of, uh, of uh, representative for the aerobic system? The, the, the aerobic decoupling, uh, for, that example, are, yeah. for example, is a kind of a, uh, well, a, a theory or a concept uh, related to this. I have had on the, the, the the Google discussion forum, I have had a rather prolonged and uh, intense debate regarding uh, just this uh, with the uh, the the good uh, Dr. Kogan, which I referred to in the in the paper, uh, where I have been uh, 
into the same th thoughts that you are presenting now, trying to correlate or to use data from the physiological to correlate that with the the, the power output data, because I think there are some uh, some some things to to learn. Except for example, I mean, if you were talking about the 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 anaerobic threshold, I mean, the anaerobic threshold can uh, is uh, is based on uh, is I. It is decided on a lot of different physiological parameters. I mean, the anaerobic threshold is, uh, it starts with the VO2 max, and then you have, you have uh, capillaries, and you have mitochondria, and you have uh, enzymes, and you have all kinds of things, uh, buffering uh, in the blood, and so on and so forth. Perhaps with, uh, with using physiological uh, variables and power you can maybe differentiate between where is the uh, performance improvement or deterioration coming from oh have you uh, lost uh, does your uh, mitochondria it's, it's not working uh, quite well well then you should do this kind of training well uh, or is it uh, capillaries or you have your vo to max been lowered that's why you're so i definitely think there there could be but there's i think we uh, pretty far from um, reaching any good understanding about this uh, at the moment, and uh, the the thing that Dr. Cogan told me then was that he his opinion is that you can basically get all the information about this from uh, the power meter as well because if you um, I have one discussion we've had is the use uh, using power meters for uh, to measure the the ability to uh, to cope with repeated efforts, because that's very important in cycling, to do a high intensity effort, recover, high intensity, recover. And uh, I was to this, trying to f start a discussion, how would a test for repeated efforts be uh, designed? And uh, the, the answer I got from him was that his opinion is that you basically get that ability within the functional threshold power because they're based on, even though the functional threshold power is more a steady state, it's based on the same physiological uh, systems in the body as, as uh, repeated efforts. Yeah, uh, so far I think we, uh, in, in a way we're in agreement, uh, uh, also with Kage. Okay. I think, uh, well, he's, uh, he's thinking perhaps uh, a couple of steps uh, uh, ahead. Uh, because uh, he based his ideas and his models on, on a quite substantial uh, amount of physiological data. Yeah. So at this point, with, to, to explain his models, he has a very good, uh, in, many, in many cases I would say, a very good uh, uh, physiological ground to stand on. And then it's possible to, with the, with the help of the model, to uh, uh, kind of extrapolate uh, some kind of what you expect us in power, but in, in one uh, time uh, before, it has, ha has to be some kind of uh, uh, research about the, uh, uh, how these uh, relate to each other. The, the and, and he has a lot of data there, so he can say, okay, I know so much about this now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you are in this range of uh, power, this is going to happen with the physiology. But if you're talking about top elite levels uh, today, for example in Sweden, it's very important, I think, to also see the individual. To have these, uh, I think many of these are very good models to use as a base, but we have to tune it to this particular rider and to see if, is this uh, uh, a rider typical or is this rider atypical? Uh, do he or she have some kind of speciality that we have to take into consideration in order not to, to drive into a or whatever? Exactly. I think there is therein lies one of the things the the biggest problems at the moment with power meters and the methods concepts and theories that are used today is that very few of them especially when it comes to the training stress score performance manager chart it's not possible to individualize the calculations for these uh, enough at least in my opinion and uh, i can say that uh, me and dr cogan uh, disagree quite heavily on this uh, on this uh, in this area because uh, he says that uh, his uh, calculations or his algorithms for a training stress score uh, which is based first of all on normalized power uh, they are sound they don't need any individualization 
uh, I do not agree at all. I think that especially on the elite level that uh, that you need to to tweak these algorithms for every rider. Just the fact that uh, that uh, the 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 recommendations he delivers uh, gives when it comes to uh, to uh, training stress score how well for a uh, given training ride Det kanske är den här uh, dosan uh, Ja, kan du den? Tror du den? I can inform you, I understand behind you in this, this particular question. Because, uh, I, I like the, uh, the modeling that he presents, for example. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, I think it's very important to, to look at the funding individual. Uh, because if you look at, uh, at uh, his... Uh, the following scale can be used as an approximate guide for training stress score. And when it says less than 150 uh, in TSS, the recovery generally complete by following day. On the other hand, uh, a one hour maximal effort gives 100 uh, points TSS, meaning that a, a normal race, uh, one hour time trial, maximal time trial, with a, a warm up and a cool down, usually gives about 150 training stress scores. And, uh, Recovery generally complete by following day. I don't think so. Uh, it, there's no way you can make a maximal effort for one hour day after day after day after day after day. And uh, I have never seen, and, and also, I mean, you can ride yourself very tired in one hour, no problem. And uh, it's very easy to get 100. Uh, TSS training stress score points from a three or four hour ride that is no problem doing day after day after day. So, I, I, I mean, for me it's just obvious that the, the model needs tweaking. Yeah. Well, the discussion will continue. <laughs> I have uh, uh, hundreds of questions. Uh, so normally discussions like this are get uh, reaches peak about after five, six hours. Oh. <laughs> I, I understand that uh, we only have uh, much shorter amount of time, so I will uh, I will um, just pick one or few more yeah. uh, questions. And it would be nice to be in the in the I like tested uh, uh, anaerobic energy range for a while. Yeah, that's and, an uh, exciting uh, yeah, place. Yeah, I remember you said that. Uh, I agree with that. It's extremely interesting. Also for guys, uh, athletes actually that are performing during hours and still, as you, as you mentioned also in, in your text. Uh, it, it can be a very brief uh, moment of time that decide the whole, which are standing on the on the top of the podium, or yep. which are standing beside it. So it's it's very important. Still, we are talking about extreme uh, aerobic performance in, in many cases here. It's definitely also of interest to look upon these uh, um, anaerobic uh, uh, energy processes. Very much in, especially in road cycling. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, uh, in this respect, um, uh, you report some interesting data concerning uh, um, muscle fiber composition, which relate uh, to different tests. Yeah. Can, can you uh, dwell a little bit on that? Well, that was maybe the, the biggest surprise for myself when I started with this paper, uh, the inertial load test, which I, I had only just heard a little bit about before I started uh, my work with this paper. but. When I started uh, learning, learning, learning more and more about it, uh, I realized that uh, that is a very interesting test that I think needs much more research because the, it could potentially have some uh, very uh, almost profound uh, implications for for cycling testing and uh, talent identification and also training because it might be possible to uh, to look at a person's muscle fiber composition with this very, very easy test. And when I say easy test, it is really easy to perform this test. And uh, I've done it, uh, especially when I was writing the paper, I, I performed this test on myself quite a few times in very different uh, situations that, uh, and under uh, very various uh, circumstances. 
and it still gives very almost the same data all the time. So it seems to be very insensitive to uh, to standardization and uh, and so on and methodology. So this seems to be an easy test that might be able to see. Okay, this person has so and so many, or, or at least in the range of this uh, more type two or type one muscle fibers, which is uh, a pre. Uh, stable innate trait in a person, so this could be very useful for talent identification. Certainly in cycling, perhaps I didn't. I don't think I mentioned it in the, in the paper, but perhaps also in other sports as well. Yeah, definitely. I think this is a very good model for many sports. The basic uh, reasoning uh, you uh, perform here is can be utilized in ma many many sports, especially if you can uh, calculate the power or measure the power. If it should be popular. Uh, then it's uh, uh, definitely uh, something very powerful, I think, to 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 combine these parameters. Um, Especially now, if with the, we can have more uh, fr uh, sampling frequency, then yeah. we can get very good uh, uh, data. And then coming to uh, high sampling frequency, I, I think we should very quickly just stop on the EMG domain, because it's uh, actually uh, uh, a possibility to lo look. Uh, from the periphery into the uh, function of the central nervous system. And you have some uh, interesting uh, data you bring up here concerning the uh, peripheral and central fatigue and uh, measured with, uh, with the use of uh, the EMG technique. Can you tell us a little bit about Well, uh, the, the, the basic point is that uh, during uh, prolonged cycling, uh, fatigue can uh, arise from different areas. Uh, either from uh, peripheral, uh, well, within the muscle, uh, or uh, or in or in the central nervous system uh, in some ways, and perhaps also with the inertial load test, it might a little bit be possible to to see where this is coming from. For example, during a, a prolonged training ride, for which in uh, elite cycling is uh, very often maybe five or even six or seven hours long maybe performing uh, the inertial load test uh, continuously, maybe once per hour or twice per hour or every, every second hour or something, to see how the, the muscle characteristics and perhaps the, also could tell a little bit about the, the nervous system, what happens to it during uh, the, the fatigue uh, experience during a, such a long ride. Uh, yeah. So, uh, of, of course, it's a very long step uh, to, to get to this point when you could really uh, start to say something about exactly. it, but, but uh, just to, to hint on it uh, as, uh, as you did uh, in, in the uh, thesis, I think it's a very good start. And there are two components. Uh, the first one is the, the amplitude of, of, the, uh, of the burst in D burst, uh, which are uh, related in one way or another to, to, the, uh, uh, to the effort from the central nervous system. And that seems to be uh, related also to some uh, type of fatigue. And, and also the power output in relation to the amount of uh, uh, activation of the muscles. The other interesting point you bring up is the coordination. That this also seems to be related to, to the uh, effectiveness, effectiveness of, the, of the rider. That they can actually switch between different muscle groups that uh, do different... Uh, uh, things at the different times of different states of uh, fatigue and so on. And here I think once again perhaps the, the, the vector might make a, bring a new dimension to this because also not only will you m perhaps uh, see uh, differences in the force velocity re uh, relationship over time during a prolong, but you can see a different uh, coordination in the pedal stroke uh, with fatigue, which uh, has been uh, researched quite a lot uh, in the lab laboratory with the EMG technology. I didn't include too much of that because, well, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of the Metrogear at the moment, but perhaps with the Metrogear you can also see coordinational uh, differences between in the beginning of a ride and in the end of a ride uh, as well, because we know that as you get tired, you pedal in a different way. Uh, the muscles, uh, the impulse of muscle, the, the, the muscles are activated, uh, well, spatially different, yes. uh, both spatially and temporally yeah. different uh, when you get tired. And we, we need to know a lot more, of course, uh, yeah. about this, but in the, in the future, I think it's possible. Perhaps also we will have uh, loggers at that time that allow us not only to, to record the power, continuously, but also uh, parameters like EMG, uh, 
uh, heart rate, everything goes into the same logger. Yeah. And, and there are timed uh, uh, from the si same time base, which is, uh, uh, from an analysis point of view, is much uh, more nice, of course, when you start to do this. But then you're or something in between the science and, and the practical handling. As you said before, there are probably limits how much you uh, can uh, stand as, as a coach and how much time you have to, to, to uh, dig into this. But uh, if you really put a lot of, of resources into, let's say, a team, there are probably going to be uh, monetary funding that allow uh, this competence and also uh, people putting time into this. Of course, uh, you have to, uh, the, the rider and the, and the coach need to say that we need the, this data. I, I say you, you will, you should miss probably power uh, meters if they just disappear from the earth. You will be very sorry because you find it's a very good tool. Yeah, and, and I think also, at least uh, in the beginning now, well, so far we're, we're, we're still in the kind of simple step when it comes a uh, simple uh, period when it comes to power meters we have to really that's why i disagree with kogan as well but even if it is useless to to uh, to do some of the research that, uh, that at least him and me were discussing it could bring some understanding try to make everything complicated to to like turn every stone around how to use a power meter in conjunction with other parameters as well and then see okay we which ones are seem to be the most effective, valid and reliable, and then use those. And then you have maybe a complete toolbox, and you don't have to use er all the tools for, uh, for every rider. For, uh, then a coach can take, okay, I, for this ride I need this, this, and this. Those three is enough. So you bring it from simple to complicated, back to simple again. That's a very good, uh, I think, uh, summary of this. And because, uh, start with a fishing trip and it ends up with very sharp uh, parameters that you really need and you can make something else. Exactly. And uh, uh, up to that stage it's a long period of research in certain areas of course. In some of the areas we know a lot more, but if you're coming down to the, uh, the function of the central nervous system, it's um, the, the black box is yeah. big. Well, I don't know if you read the, the pedagogical part. Yes, uh, I did. Yeah, and there's yeah. a little bit more discussions there around the central governor and uh, yeah. all those. That's a debate as well. Yeah, big debate. Uh, with the permission of the examiner, can I take the la last uh, piece of uh, questions? Is that okay? Yes. All right. The audience uh, still uh, has awake. I start to get uh, warmed up. <laughs> and then we have to finish. But anyway, um, a couple of questions more then. Uh, uh, what are, are, according to your opinion, um, about the performance profile? among the best uh, road cyclists today, uh, what power pro profiles can uh, they apply? Uh, and uh, are they superior in any particular energy system, do you think? You mean the, the power profiling uh, uh, area? During racing. Yeah. I really wish we could get this one going so I could have a... The other aspect I will bring into, uh, which you bring up, uh, is the uh, transition between energy systems, which, which I find very interesting when you're talking about intermittent and continuous work. So if you could... Um, uh, you mean the, the critical power? Uh, critical power and also the uh, normalized power. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the difference uh, when, you uh, when you move between uh, different energy systems, as you do uh, when you do the uh, stochastic race, for example, exactly. and, and also in the uh, interval training. If you could blend that into the same reasoning, I would be very happy. Let's see. I think I have prepared some slides that are not in your uh, in your papers. Uh, all right. We have. Uh, let's see. Which ones I have? Well, we can start with the power profiling uh, here. When it comes to power profiling, uh, like I say in the in the paper, there are some kind of distinct uh, profiles for uh, different types of riders. Uh, I know that they have updated uh, these uh, these data uh, in the the Cycling Peaks uh, Training Peaks uh, WKO program, because one major problem with this is that this data comes from uh, from uh, especially when it comes to the world class cyclists comes from a period uh, from the beginning of the 90s until maybe the beginning of uh, this millennium where we 
are pretty sure that uh, not only training and uh, healthy living uh, was uh, producing these power numbers in a lot of riders. So perhaps some of the, the world class uh, uh, performance levels are physiologically unattainable. Uh, we don't know. But uh, when it comes to the profiles, there are some typical profiles. Uh, either, the, I mean, the typical sprinter has usually a high uh, in this area and usually lower in this. The, and the typical time trialer or, uh, well, especially the typical time trialer has a good uh, uh, power output in this area. All rounders have a pretty... Uh, uh, equal uh, level in all different uh, aspects. It is quite uncommon for people to be very good in in both this area and this area. So it's I'm um, extremely unlikely to see somebody have a profile that looks like this up here. Usually, if you are up here in some area, then you are down here in in another area. Uh, you, you state in, in in your thesis that uh, uh, one. Uh, one uh, uh, characteristic uh, of uh, the top riders is that they they can perform longer time about the LT threshold. Yeah, and that says something I think also about the uh, this transition uh, reason that they they can endure this type of, of uh, metabolism that are occurring on, on this uh, intensity level. What's your opinion about that? Well, uh, when it comes to the what. When you say LT, do you mean the the like two the MLS? Million, two millimole. The two millimole, which is probably more around like. We can, uh, we can take the, F the TP as well. The F, well, the FT, the, the functional threshold, no, fresh threshold power, the 60 minute power output, uh, that is the anaerobic threshold. Yeah. But I think what you were into here uh, when you said that the, pro the professional riders usually can endure longer times over the LT, which with the LT is more correlated, more closely to fat max, uh, which is why I included uh, the, the, the test for a mean maximal power output for maybe three hours or something. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is uh, where we see, uh, like I said, one of the biggest uh, differences between uh, world-class riders and uh, amateur riders. There are very small differences usually between a world-class rider and a, for example a top professional and a top amateur. They are very usually, if they have, they have the same characteristics, very close here. But here it's a usually a bigger difference and you, if you go a little bit lower in the power output then the professional rider can usually maintain that power for a longer time and an interesting thing, and that's also worthwhile testing, testing in during fatigue, and then I would say that the professional rider, if they have been riding for five hours at a submaximal level, then they will have a, there will be a big difference between a professional rider and an amateur rider in the, the mean maximal power output for five minutes after five hour of, uh, hours riding before that. That's where the big differences are, and I think, well, at the elite level, you can start doing tests uh, okay. there as well. Mm -hmm. If we back to the normalized power, oh, there it was. Uh, like you said, the, the transition between, uh, because the normalized power is uh, kind of a way to calculate how intense, uh, when you have a very variable power output during a, a ride, uh, the average power tends to be a lot lower, even if you go maximally for one hour, very variably, like this. Oops. Uh, up and down for one hour, and you're exhausted here. The average power for that hour usually is lower than your average power output during a maximal ride for one hour at constant level of power output. So the normalized power is a way to try to calculate how hard would a variable ride be if it had been a steady state. Uh, and as we can see here, I think this line, the blue line here, is the, the average power output and the red one is the calculated normalized power output. So what this actually kind of does is uh, tries to, uh, to, to calculate how the supramaximal uh, work, how that uh, puts pores uh, strain into your uh, effort bucket, so to speak, and then how the the submaximal ride uh, the riding b between this kind of drains uh, strain from the effort bucket. 
And that's also an area where I think that Dr. Cargan has made an excellent job uh, producing normalized power, but I think for some writers, um, his algorithm isn't perfect, which is, of course, highlighted by the fact that on the, the, the forum we have a discussion of something somebody termed the, coined the term uh, normalized power busters, mm -hmm. which is uh, because if you're doing a one hour ride uh, and it's a maximal ride and it's very variable, the normalized power should not be able to, uh, to be higher than your functional threshold power because the functional threshold power, the definition of that is your maximal one hour average power output and uh, that is the highest average power output is easily, most easily attained during a constant. So if you have a very variable uh, ride and after one hour you have a normalized power that is higher than your functional threshold power, something is wrong. And just the fact that a lot of riders, because well, I can't really see, maybe we can go back with this one, we can see how many uh, have been, let's see if we can find normalized power uh, busters normalized power should be here ah uh, maybe it's not